great. So thank you all for joining us, and thank, thanks to all of you for, for being here. Uh, my name is Kartik Desai. Uh, I work for an organization called Asha Impact, uh, which is an impact investment fund based in India. And uh, we are here today to discuss specifically uh, the topic of impact investing uh, as it's practiced in India and in the United States. Uh, two large countries, two dynamic economies, uh, both of which are considered hubs of social innovation and entrepreneurship, including impact entrepreneurship. And we are very fortunate to have a great uh, panel here and some very, very experienced folks uh, who have experience doing impact investing in both countries. So the idea is to kind of talk about the relative lessons that have come out of impact investing in both of these markets, both to understand whether there's things that one can learn from each other. Is it possible to have kind of a more globally aligned definition or thought process or best practices? And not just for the, the US and India, but for the broader market. Uh, if you could take of them as a representative for a, a fast growing emerging market and a large developed country market. Uh, so that's, that's the context and we'd like to make it as interactive as possible. So perhaps after uh, getting the perspectives from each of the panelists, uh, we'd love to hear some of your views as well. And hopefully more people who, who join us uh, over the course of the hour. Uh, so uh, rather than doing introductions, if it's okay, we'd like to directly maybe go through each panelist and get, 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 get your thoughts. And maybe you could also take the time to briefly introduce yourself and what you do. So we'll start with, uh, to my right, uh, Mr. PR Ganfati, or, or Gans, if I, can, if I can call you that. Uh, who's the CEO of the Vilgro Innovation Foundations, one of the earliest impact investors in India. So Gans, if you could just share your perspective a little bit about, uh, about Vilgro and specifically over the last, I think, almost 15 years that you guys have been working in India. Uh, what is it you know, about impact investing in India that makes it unique, that makes it special, and what are the key lessons and insights about impact investment that you think makes India a unique case in the world, which other sure. countries could learn from? Yeah, thanks a lot, Karthik. So as Karthik mentioned, Bilger Innovations Foundation has funded and supported social entrepreneurs in India since 2015. And we now also manage the Mentera Social Impact Fund. Uh, I think some of the lessons that we've learned over time, we were at the Big Bang or the beginning of that movement in India in 2001. Off late, of course, you've seen the startup craze and the entrepreneurship craze quite catch the fancy of young people. Uh, and I think that's spilled over into the social sector. So you're seeing a significant increase in terms of the number of young people wanting to apply their skills and entrepreneurial talents to solving social problems. However, I still think we have a quality problem. Uh, we see a lot of ideas, but we see very few really good ideas. And I think that's partly driven by the youth and inexperience of some of the entrepreneurs, but also perhaps because in a society like ours, we're very stratified, and I think the problems of our, the poorer people and, and, and real society problem are very far removed from the sort of experiences of people who get a good education, go to an IIT and an IIM. And finally, at the root of good entrepreneurship is good understanding of customer pain and problems. And so we have to figure mechanisms by which we can break some of those barriers down if we have to improve the quality of our pipeline. I think the second big lesson uh, is that it's not enough to provide these entrepreneurs with money. And if you're getting entrepreneurs who don't check all your boxes, they're not the perfect deal, uh, there are areas of weakness. Typically, those weaknesses are with the management team. They'll be unidimensional. They'll all be technologists. Or they'll be inexperienced. And so you have to do a lot to help those entrepreneurs after you make the investment. So be prepared to spend time hand-holding the company, assigning a mentor for the company, opening doors, helping them find co-founders and the right skills, because otherwise your investment's at serious risk. And so you've got to be able to walk those extra steps. I think lastly, before I sign off, is the challenge of exit. I think it's very important, because we all manage money from investors, that we have to create a pathway to generating an exit. However, the time that these companies take to scale up and the fact that in a developing country, we do, for example, a lot of work in medical devices. And you would think that logically these medical devices that have been developed and deployed in the field would be acquired by you know, uh, some of the big healthcare companies and provide an exit opportunity for investors. Mm -hmm. But the make versus buy decision typically is very much make versus buy, uh, as opposed to you know, countries like the US where 
the time to market and speed is so important that oftentimes buy makes more sense than make. And so exits are a real challenge. And we have a regulatory environment that perhaps does not permit some of the innovation that we've seen in self-liquidating instruments in the US, such as John Kohler's work around the demand dividend or, the, or uh, you know, those other instruments. So that's something to think about consciously, is who's going to give you an exit and how's that going to happen? So those are my three opening remarks. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, I would love to get uh, Victoria's perspective. Victoria is the uh, head of investments, the managing director of Village Capital Fund, which is one of the most interesting impact investing organizations out there, uh, specifically supporting very early stage entrepreneurs with their unique peer selection, uh, selection uh, methodology, where the entrepreneurs themselves select who gets funded. And they've been doing this now for, I think, quite some time in, in, in various emerging markets. I, in fact, as, at one point, I was a social entrepreneur before I became an investor and participated in the very first village capital program many years ago in India. And I know you run these in Africa and in the United States. Mm -hmm. And Ross, uh, who's the founder of Village Capital, recently published his book, uh, which you guys must have heard about, which specifically talks about how a lot of venture capital dollars flow into you know, the, the people like us, the PLUs, uh, in living in Boston or uh, wherever, in San Francisco, and in the Indian case, in Bombay, Bang Bangalore, Hyderabad, et cetera, and not into smaller, smaller towns. So I was hoping if you could just share a little bit more specifically about the insights of Village Capital, since you guys have specifically been looking at investing in entrepreneurs in small towns in the US, small towns in India, and other emerging markets. What are the similarities and the differences? And what are specifically some of, some of the aspects of the American impact investing experience that we could learn in India? Yeah, sure. So i um, glad to be here. And I think that gives a, a good overview of Village Capital uh, for the last uh, seven or eight years, we've been deploying uh, this two-sided model where we run programs for cohorts of entrepreneurs across five sectors. So the themes that we focus on are affordable access to health, education, financial services, and then sustainable energy and food and agriculture. Um, and so we've gotten a chance to sort of compare across those sectors and across the geographies where we work, um, some of the, the things that we've seen develop across ecosystems. Uh, and the markets outside of the US where we're active are India, East and West Africa, and Mexico. Um, I think, you know, over that, the time frame that, that we've been operating, certainly it's been exciting to see impact investing uh, in the US just continue to gain a lot of momentum and attention and fervor. Um, and there have been sort of gaps in seeing some of that fervor actually meet the capital deployment. Um, and I think that's you know, a theme that's spoken about frequently at SOCAP. But um, the last year or so, I think it's been incredibly exciting to see uh, a much more institutional focus um, and, and capital availability that really has volume. Um, shine a light on the potential of this space. So not least of which is things like TPG and Rise, um, but Bain and a, a lot of uh, large foundations shifting to 100% impact that I think hopefully will mean that we're getting capital across all levels of the spectrum um, that, that need to meet the market. Where we work in, uh, you know, Guns makes an interesting point about sort of the, the quality of entrepreneurs and providing them with enough uh, resources and support so that they can actually get to the next level. So, you know, maybe they get an early stage check, but then can they actually meet milestones that will attract a seed or a Series A round? Um, and we're seeing a great uh, disparity in what those opportunities look like across the country here. So you have, you know, extremely well-developed ecosystems out here in the Bay Area, in New York, in Boston, um, and there are many other parts of the country where we're seeing you know, a real dearth of resources and early stage capital for entrepreneurs. That's one of the things that we're trying to focus on. Um, and then I think the other interesting piece uh, that I would say in terms of where impact investing has sort of been going over the, the time that we have been operating is thinking about the, the blended resources of both philanthropic and uh, commercial capital and the, the availability of things like program-related investments from foundations that we've seen um, contribute to an early start in some enterprises. And so maybe, you know, can talk about how that's uh, apl applied in India versus the U.S. Great. Uh Coming next to Aud Audrey. Uh, uh, Audrey uh, is runs Artha Initiative, which many of you would have heard of, and they also make uh, uh, early stage equity investments and have supported uh, many, many social enterprises in India, some of whom are quite well known. Uh, your enterprises, Audrey, are kind of spread all across India, right? 
And my question is, how do you address this challenge that Ross and, and you know, Victoria are talking about, which is finding the right entrepreneurs, which Guns also mentioned. The best entrepreneur may often be sitting in a smaller town, uh, but his capacity, his or her capacity uh, may be, you know, more, he, he, leave, he or she will need more support. So how do you guys go about that? And particularly as a foreign investor or as an investor sitting in, you know, in, in outside India, could you talk a little bit more about how Artha has gone about finding the right entrepreneurs and, and what you have seen as impact investing uh, evolve over the last uh, decade or so based on your experience? Sure, with pleasure, thank you. Um, so the program that I've been involved with uh, helping to, to, to run over the past 10 years has, um, has evolved and uh, the way that we've addressed the issue of trying to work with the right entrepreneurs is we've partnered with um, Bill Grow and Mentera. Right. <laughs> so that was the easiest way to, to handle it. I mean, it became very- but before, before that, that was recent, right? Yes, it's relatively recent, and it's um, it's it, it's on the back of a of a rather long and arduous process of realizing one's shortcomings as an external investor to the country. Just plainly speaking, I mean, uh, we're a classic example of a, uh, I would say a well-intentioned um, diasporan, high net worth individual who wants to engage, wants to make a difference, but wasn't ready to necessarily deploy a team in country. Uh, and 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 given and and to have you know somebody who speaks the language and who is better suited to the job, frankly. Um, but what what initially happened was first five six years, it was very much helicopter helicoptering in hello, and spending um, probably the equivalent of three to four months of the year uh, running around and trying to meet and understand the landscape. That took a couple of years. Um, starting to do the first impact investments and understanding how to structure these transactions and how to navigate the complex regulatory um, circumstances um, in which one finds themselves. And I think um, there's been incredible learning uh, from the companies and the, the experience of managing a portfolio from afar. I think that there's an incredible ecosystem in India, which I would say is mirrored by the um, concentration of of, of, of great players here in the US looking at social businesses in, in American cities. I, I don't know the prevalence of great opportunities in tier two and tier three American cities. I'm aware of some of what goes on in the peri-urban areas of major mm -hmm. tier one cities. But I can say for certain that we didn't have access uh, to uh, anything beyond the usual suspects uh, in the first couple of years, in the first five, six years of what we were doing with Artha. Um, we try our part and where I think our strength is, is um, in networking with those like ourselves outside. And so uh, aggregating information and, and, and cultivating relationships with those who would be co-investors and partners in, in getting involved in, deal in these types of op investment opportunities is something we do relatively well. We do a lot of that informally. We do some of it formally with a technical with a platform that attempts to aggregate data. So there's a lot about the data piece, but all things related to discovery, good diligence and execution and post-investment management have come on the back of our close partnership with Mentera. Do you think there's enough uh, social entrepreneurs in India? And what I, I'll just contextualize that question. I've been speaking to a lot of entrepreneurs who are here at SOCAP the ones who are you know, here on the scholarship and they're, they're a few from India and an interesting thought emerged and some of them are in this room and you know, feel free to speak up if you guys wanna you know, add a comment. The view was that in, in India, the entrepreneurs are more business focused and in the US, there's so much uh, uh, you know, awareness of social entrepreneurship that every variation of, of some pro project to the other is happening. But some people have a different view that no, there are, that that's the right approach, that in India, by default, 80% of businesses which are serving the masses will have impact built in into uh, their DNA. Or do you think that, so, so which side of it would you agree more? You know, that do, is there a need for more evangelizing of social entrepreneurship and more social entrepreneurs? Or when you do the Artha Venture Challenge in the past at Asankalp or now with Mentera, uh, do you see a, a large number of entrepreneurs approaching you? Or is, as you said, the quality of the entrepreneurs, I'm talking about quality entrepreneurs. Yeah, I mean, on, for, and I would be interested in hearing uh, my colleagues' perspectives on this, but I would be loath to err on the side of thinking that the default setting of an entrepreneur, just because they're working in a, a challenging environment, is social. Uh, we've seen m many situations, and in fact, 
the drift of, you know, the typical mission drift um, type of situation where you risk uh, losing sight of the impact objectives entirely by virtue of a shift in the priorities or the shift in the strategy related to the margins you want to achieve or the kind of customer segment that you're serving. This happens all the time. I think it's, it's, it's about being more deliberate, more intentional, and, and uh, not taking that at all for granted. Uh, coming to, to Maya, Maya, you've worked with Elevar, and now, now you're working with TPG Rise. Um, and could you give us a bit of a global context, and specifically with respect to the definition of impact investing? In the Indian context, which is what uh, I'm familiar with, we talk about in terms of the beneficiary focus, yes. that there's a certain income criteria, or a social sector focus, that it must be in education, healthcare, agri, and so on. Uh, and finally, an intentionality focus, which is sometimes questioned. And it could be argued that in the US, the intentionality focus is more robust because you have the B Corps and people thinking about that, whereas in the Indian context, it's, it can be sometimes an afterthought. So what to you constitutes, how do you define impact investing when you think about it in a global context? And what are the similarities and differences between doing impact investment in a developed country versus a developing country? Um, thanks, Karthik. So the range of experience that I have, as Karthik mentioned, is um, at Elevar, we were basically making Series A investments in companies that were serving um, low-income customers, underserved communities in India and in Latin America. And now at uh, the RISE Fund, which is the, the, the fund that um, we've raised at TPG Growth, um, which is a $2 billion fund um, investing all across the globe in, in seven sectors. Um, we, we do have actually, you know, when our, our second deal was a deal in India, uh, so interestingly I can talk about that. But I, I, think, I think I have a slightly um, different perspective on even the Indian experience just on, based on what we, we did at Elevar. But l let, me, let me come to that and let me address your question. So um, within the, the developing world context, um, I think uh, for us it's been pretty clear with the RISE Fund lens that um, the notion of serving underserved markets is pretty clear. So if you look at business models um, in the developing world, very often you'll find a mass business model, which would encompass um, lower income individuals, and then there's a slightly uh, different business model for the wealthy. So if I just look at uh, TPG's historical experience, are we hearing, is that me? No, no, I think one of us has the We're thing okay. okay. <laughs> um, if I look at if I look at TBG's investing experience, um, uh, TBG, for example, invested in a hospital chain in Sri Lanka, and so most people would say Sri Lanka, emerging market, you know, uh, largely low income. But if you look at this, and, and therefore investing in, in healthcare in, in Sri Lanka must be impact. But if you look at it the way that we look at it in the RISE Fund, the, the, the customer base for this hospital chain was actually quite wealthy. And they would fly to India or they would fly to Singapore or they would fly to London for their medical treatment and you were basically replacing the need to fly somewhere for your medical treatment with medical treatment in, com in country. And so if you think about impact, even though healthcare is a good thing, you weren't doing anything ex except creating more convenience for the for the wealthy in the in, in this country, and for us that was that was not impact. And I think that if you look at um, what we think of as impact in the emerging markets, a lot of the times, especially in these core uh, services areas, ag, it's smallholder farmers, um, income benefit. There may be environmental or sustainability benefits too, but we're really looking at smallholder farmer and income uplift, and not at you know big ag. Um, in it's education, it's the same. We're looking at mass education strategies as opposed to education for the elite. So that, that is very clear. If you look at it in the U.S. context, the conversation becomes a lot more mixed. If you look at healthcare or education, you know, often there's a broad swath of, uh, of education or even financial services that serves the entire spectrum of, 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 of society and income levels and not just the low income. So you have to have a slightly different view and a slightly different uh, definition, and that's probably the most stark um, contrast that I can make between India or other emerging markets and what, what we're doing here in the developed world, is the notion of who the customer is, where the benefit is, if it's just a low-income person or if it's society at large, is slightly different because of the structure of, of, of the society, because of the structure of services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one other difference um, you know, that I'd like to call out in the global context is um, that 
at least you know, with the Elevar experience that we had in India, um, and even with the TPG uh, uh, RISE Fund experience that we have in India versus the U.S. experience, we actually um, at Elevar and today with RISE are finding that there are more entrepreneurs who we are meeting in the developing world context who don't wear impact on their sleeve. So it's not maybe the traditional early stage social entrepreneur, but it's the ex, um, you know, head of a division from ICICI Bank who just basically said, I love this customer, I love this business, I'm gonna do the right thing by this customer. Forget calling it impact, forget calling it social enterprise. The nature of the business that I'm building is a large opportunity for this large customer base, which is wildly untapped, and I know how to do better for that customer base. So they're not, and, and, and they, they get actually sometimes a little bit nervous about being labeled as a social enterprise entrepreneur or an impact entrepreneur because there sometimes is a little bit of a um, veneer that you might be not fully market oriented or fully hardcore business oriented or oriented towards building a great large performing company. In the US, it's actually the opposite. So interestingly, in the US, the companies that we are seeing within the RISE Fund that we're interested in are extremely hardcore about mission and the purpose of what they're doing. And they are not as mixed. So they tend to be maybe a little bit younger as well. So they're a little bit more sort of close to the millennial. In, uh, in the Elevar context, the most successful entrepreneurs that we backed were all in their mid 40s and up. Our biggest failures were the 25 to 35 year olds who had never run a company before, who had great vision about a, a, a problem that they wanted to solve, but had just never executed to the scale and the level that you need to be successful in India. And so we took sort of the crusty, again, you know, 50 year old from um, ICICI or from Unilever, and all they wanted to do was build a great business, you know, at the, at the mass level. In the US, the, the entrepreneurs who are coming to, to rise, um, you know, they're not 25 years old, but they are all about purpose and they are all about mission and they are all about the good that they're doing. And they don't want a normal private equity fund to back them. They want an impact fund to back them because it, just, it, 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 it effectively amplifies their brand that I care about the world and I'm build, building a successful company but I'm not in it just to build a successful company. I'm in this because I want to change the world and do something great. And that's also an interesting contrast. One last uh, statement I'll make about the global context is that if you look at Africa, what's interesting is, you know, so I, I was uh, lucky enough to start um, investing in Indian companies uh, about 12 years ago. Africa today um, in certain economies looks like India 12 years ago in terms of the infrastructure, the level of entrepreneurial um, capability, et cetera. And, and it's very interesting to think about what can be done in Africa learning from the Indian experience. And this could be true of other you know, frontier markets, maybe like Myanmar. It's less true of places like Indonesia or the Philippines or, you know, or certainly China, which are different. But if you look at some of the African context and um, other, other parts of, the, uh, of South Asia or, or going over to Myanmar, you know, there are lessons to be learned actually from the Indian experience because they're some years behind. Fantastic, thank you so much for that. That, sure. that actually puts it very crisply and maybe I can take, take, take that to you Vikram. Uh, uh, Vikram, as many of you know, is someone who is, uh, you know, who, he's the founder of Asha Impact. He's made many, many impact investments in India as well as in the US. Now you're teaching in the US and this topic of impact investing. So as Maya said, you know, there's this Successful entrepreneurs in the U.S. and India are looking very different. In India, they're more commercially oriented. They don't want, they in fact, as you said, almost see impact as a negative thing, saying, don't call me impact. Which begs the question, why would you say that? Is something wrong with impact? Whereas in the U.S., they proudly wear that badge. And they're younger, and you know, there's a, there's a clear distinction. So, and you're working with students and entrepreneurs on both sides. So could you help us think through why they're different? And is one better than the other? Or how can one even think about framing this issue? Or, <laughs> sorry, like the most difficult question for, for, for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> you mean the crusty 50-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> or the impactful guy or who wears it on his sleeve? Or? I'm the crusty 50-year-old. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think if I, if I just try and put you know, the different kind of p uh, pieces of the system in, uh, and compare them. So if you look at entrepreneurs, and we're talking about India and the US, 
you know, the fact of the matter is that relative to most parts of the world, actually India and the U.S. produce the most number of entrepreneurs. Uh, can you hear me? No? Uh, that, that, you know, if you look at, if you look at entrepreneurship, you know, India and the U.S. produce perhaps the most number of entrepreneurs, uh, you know, and, and are very well known for that. So the question is, like, why is it different, really, is, and is it really different? I mean, I think Miami has had the experience of investing in older people who don't want to be called impact, but, you know, in Asha, in fact, we've invested in younger people who yeah. swear by the fact that they are actually making a massive difference. Yeah. And at the same time, I could take examples of, of uh, companies here in the U.S. or uh, social entrepreneurs who basically don't want to be called impact in the social entrepreneurs because they feel that that actually impedes them. So while I think there is that bucket, I'm not so, so clear that it's, that it's kind of pretty universal. If I had to highlight a couple of differences where we both could learn from each other, I think uh, one is just the sources and pools of capital. So if you look at the funds that, that exist over here, and I think there's been, again, there's a lot more to do, but in the US, you know, the family offices have made a big push and have actually started investing in this. The, the Rice Fund would be a good example, and Village Capital and others of commercial capital coming in. And in fact, if you look at uh, impact investing in India, I think 95% of the capital will be international capital. Um, a large chunk of that will be development capital. And so I think the big thing that in India we need to make a, you know, make a big push on is really bringing in private family offices and other forms of private capital to actually invest in India. I mean, it's kind of ironic, though, when you, when you start talking about, you know, you start making pitches to people about raising funds and this and that, and you come all over the place and say, well, how many Indians actually invest in impact investing? And the, and the answer exactly. is tiny. Yeah. And so part of when we set up Asha Impact was basically to go after family offices. So essentially, it's basically eight family offices uh, looking at investing, and except for one, all of them are Indian family offices. And so I think that's a big, big difference in terms of what we need to push on from the India perspective. I would, I would also say that from um, India's aspiration, and I think that's another thing we could learn from the U.S., is that the U.S. funds are all global. Everything we've talked about here is global. But most Indian funds, and you could say, well, the opportunity in India is so huge, et cetera, most Indian funds are Indian. And I think there is an opportunity, I think a few of them are starting to look at it, to your yeah. Maya's point, just taking what you learned in India and extending it to Sri Lanka, extending it to other parts around the South Asian continent, going to Africa. So I think that's the, the second piece that I would think about. And the third piece, uh, to the old point of view that, you know, in India, I mean, impact investing is all about bottom of the pyramid, I think we need to get away from that mindset. I think that's important too. But there are so many great entrepreneurs in India where are using technology, where are using financial engineering, where could help the poor, could, but actually could be hugely beneficial for society at large. So I think those are the three areas which, you know, I, I think there's a lot of learning that, that, that could happen across, across borders. Absolutely. I think, I think that last point that you made, you know, as I'm someone who's grown up equally, uh, literally spent exactly, I think, equal amount of time in the U.S. and in India, and I find it fascinating. That, uh, and I've actually spent a lot of time thinking and reflecting about this. Yeah. That, uh, and that's one of the things I, I really loved about coming to SOCAP is just understanding the, because uh, uh, you're, you're still talking about disenfranchised groups. It's just that we're, they're defining it here in the US, you guys are defining it here in the US, not just on an income criteria. It's, you know, it could be uh, on race, it could be on uh, some other form of deprivation. Whereas in India, we're sort of cutting across that because of our local factors. Yeah. Because race and religion and caste are very sensitive issues and we don't want that to be the primary issue. We say the main, the main issue should be poverty. But if I can just ask, because I know there's several of you guys are in the room uh, who I've spoken to in the last few days, how many of you folks would like identify yourself as impact entrepreneurs and proudly wear impact on your sleeve? And how many folks would prefer to just you know say, look, I'm a business person and impact is part of what I do, but the I'm just a business person. Got it. <laughs> All right. Good answer. Know your audience. Good yeah. answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the, the point that Maya was making in our experience has, has been a little bit more similar to Vikram's, that we've seen a mix of both on the age range and on the sort of embracing the uh, impact-oriented term, even if people are not self-labeling as social enterprise. Um, but it's a, it's a recruitment tool. Like, they want to be in the US, you want to be building a mission-driven company because you think it will get you better talent. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious to hear perspectives on whether you think that 
is the same yet in India. Because um, we, the Indian entrepreneurs we've worked with have, have ranged in age from, you know, your sort of prototypical mid-20s or early 30s founder to somebody who's built a couple businesses already and is, you know, doing a next chapter. Um, so maybe I can take that question and just frame it for everyone. And there's exactly the right question, which is that, is it a cultural difference uh, of thinking about impact, non-impact, and how we are sort of geared as, as societies? Or is it structural and li relating to regulation and policy that, and, or, or the level of market development, which are fundamentally structural factors, right? What are the drivers of, 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 uh, of the difference between the various differences that have been highlighted? If any of you guys would comment on that. So my experience has been that it's, uh, really boils down to what's the source of the fire inside the entrepreneur. Those who don't want to be labeled as impact are those who have aspirations of raising money from a, a Sequoia or a Helia. And they feel that the brand of impact will somehow constrain their ability to raise funding from those investors. And regrettably, we've had a number of such entrepreneurs who described themselves as impact because we were one of the few organizations that were willing to fund them at the super early stage before they had a prototype. But the moment they had a prototype and some traction to show, they went to a Helion or a Sequoia and raised money from those people. And then after that, you know, they pivoted their model claiming there were difficulties in serving the customer segment we had funded them to serve. Now, when I go back to my donors, I feel like I've done them a, a serious disservice mm. because their money has now gone to create a product that is not serving the people they want it to serve. Mm. So what we've begun to do is we took a page out of the Gates Foundation's Global Access Clause in their funding agreement, and we add a clause saying that here are your social impact targets, and if you don't achieve these targets, you have to return your money to us with a 25% IRR. It is a poisonous spill, there's no doubt about it, but unfortunately I've burnt my fingers so many times that I have no option but to have such an agree a clause in my funding agreement. Can I ask a question related to that? Is it about capital availability? If you had like a, not an unlimited pool of money, but like hundreds of millions of dollars like Sequoia, then those entrepreneurs who, who are wanting to go to Sequoia because of the scale, they say we can reach a certain level of success here, but if we really want to be big, we ultimately have to get to commercial capital. Or yeah, is it again about intentionality that those I entrepreneurs never really I think it's really intentionality, it in uh, Karthik. I feel like that entrepreneur that went and raised commercial capital was very focused on the fact that that valuation meant that his personal paper wealth was X, and it went to Y. Not that he was serving 5 million farmers and this funding would help him serve 15. And so that was my, but again, I'm just extrapolating from yeah, three or four data <laughs> points. Uh, there may be other perspectives. And I'd but love but, to but I, would say, I would say, Gans, you know, the you point you, you said, and I'd love to hear the perspective on that, you felt burnt that when this happened. And the question really is that you set someone on the path, they are doing something for the farmers. If some other commercial capital coming in where they can actually take whatever they're doing for the farmers and scale it up, you should be happy that you've actually achieved your mission. I would be, but the problem is that they didn't do that. They said, the farmers are too difficult to serve. Let's take this let's technology pivot. and let's do it with, uh, you know, a stock brokerage. They completely yeah. change the customer They segment. completely yeah. change the customer What's wrong with stock brokers? <laughs> <laughs> so. No, this has happened. Yeah. I, I you guys have also seen this in your portfolio. The impact tagging yeah. and the self-identification. Uh, uh, of course, you know, to a certain extent, you want to applaud the opportunistic behavior, right? Yeah. On some level, you're an entrepreneur, you have to be... You have to be ready to, to do the dance and to, to know your audience. Um, but on several occasions, we've seen the misuse of the tagging because you know that you're talking to an impact investor who on some level is going to, you think, be more of a pushover than the average investor. Uh, and by pushover, I mean the specifics of the structure, the terms, the time horizons, the conversion rates, the, the, the willingness to go down on a, you know, the the prefer you know the, the the coupon on the preference share um, small things but it, this this has played out on a number of different occasions and i don't think it works it works to the detriment of the of the sector as a whole but if i if i can add to this conversation so uh, a few observations one is this execution is hard right so there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are going to go in well intentioned 
and they're not going to be able to get the business model right and make it work. And I think, you know, the question is pivot in the business model because they can't execute to the, to the vision that they had, so they pivot, or you let them go and they just fail, period. And, and, and there's an end. And, and you know, in the, in the Elevar experience, we actually saw the failure route as opposed to the pivot route. And the question is, what is the better outcome? And it's really hard. And I think that's why I made the statement at the beginning where um, in the Elevar model, we became very careful about choosing execution capability based on years of experience and execution on the ground rather than the younger social entrepreneur because um, these things are really hard to do. It's really had to, hard to crack a business model at scale for um, you know, some of the things that, that we've, we've, we've tried to do in India. And the question is pivot or just die, right? And maybe, maybe that's, you know, that's one of the, <laughs> um, it's, it's annoying, it's frustrating to see them pivot, but the other option is they just die. Or a, a third thing that we found in some of our Indian companies is, you know, for instance, a healthcare technology company that said, we're gonna go into, you know, rural frontline training, and they keep that as part of their mission, but say, these sales cycles are so long, and it, the work is so hard that it's turning out to be a lot faster for us to sell into some number of private hospitals. And then the question is, you know, how much impact is enough? Um, and our stance has been, like, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If they are serving a blended market and we're still getting some amount of access to the you know, population that we cared about and they're able to actually continue running the business by selling to this other market, like that's the way the business will survive. And it's not a total pivot, but it's also not, okay, we can't fully make the business viable off of the one demographic we thought we were gonna serve, so we gotta throw our hands up and quit. Um, but we've come into conflict with co-investors around that who did have really strong teeth in their investment agreements that said, no, it's got to be, you know, X percent and it's more than 50 percent of your customer base has to be in this income bracket or it doesn't count anymore. Um, and I think there's a real tension for investors to work out there. Absolutely. No, this is great. Uh, I just wanted to open it up to the audience as well before we uh, close in comments. Please. Can you get the mic to him, please? Just turn off my. You need me to turn off my mic, right? Uh, thanks, Karthik, for taking our corridor conversation so seriously and putting it up on stage. I appreciate that. Uh, question, uh, actually, a comment beforehand that you know, Indian VCs at early stage, seed and Series A, are looking primarily at tech and mobile, and if your business is any brick and mortar angle, it immediately gets classified in a different category. The business uh, at, at that level, at seed level, either you have family offices, as Vikram said, are not interested in investing in anything that's less than 30% IRR, or family and friends who would put in money, but then call you immediately and say, where's this business going? You know? So there is very limited capital available for uh, a lot of people at seed and series A in India where it's not a pure tech play. I have two questions out of that. A, how do we build that ecosystem as investors? And two, uh, we've got uh, DBL partners getting into SpaceX. You know, we've got, uh, America sees a very different kind of early stage investing impact plus, uh, you know, in the large commercial sense. Do you see more Indian VCs getting into that kind of business where a takeout of a Artha could be from a Sequoia? So my questions around those two things. Uh, okay, so on the thing of, of um uh, on, on you know how to get more capital so basically forget about impact investing for a second the vc industry in india itself is a foreign capital dominated industry right so in fact the biggest issue that the vc and private equity industry associations in india talk about is where's the domestic capital because again it's all foreign capital i think you know the vc industry itself has got issues but i think in terms of getting capital in for impact investing particularly you know, it's not gonna be the institutional investors because they themselves have huge restrictions. Right now, they only invest in certain kind of stocks and all that. It's gotta be the family offices. And I, I, I think that what's changed a lot in India, and I'm seeing that, but it takes time, is that there's been a lot more wealth creation in India in the last 10 years, okay? So there's a lot of first generation wealth being created as we speak. A lot of those people are in a younger age bracket. So there's that whole millennial kind of mindset which probably didn't, doesn't exist in the previous generation. 
So when I, when I go and talk to people like that, the issue which you know, came out a little bit over here is that you don't want to call it impact investing, you don't want to call it whatever, that's fine. But just think of it, it's half the Indian population is a massive market. And if there's an entrepreneur out there, and it is going to be very difficult to execute, et cetera, but if there's an entrepreneur out there who is willing to do that, has a great idea to do it, and they will they focus on get, generating market returns, and the other question is, like, what the hell does market returns mean? But that's a separate issue. Is that, you know, you just have to kind of focus around a product or a service, that there's a huge hole there in products and services, and if a company can come up and deliver a product and service at a price point that makes sense for the customer, the farmer, whoever else, and has a business model that can deliver it in a profitable manner, then that's a good investment. And so I think that's one. The second thing which I'm seeing in the family offices particularly is that is what Gunn said before, which is it's not just about the money. People actually want to get involved with helping people to grow and scale. And a lot of social entrepreneurs are very well-intentioned, they have great hearts, but they actually don't know how to build good businesses. And so that, that would be the other. So that's yeah, on the family office side. I'll leave it for the other panelists to comment on the other part. Hello. Yeah, hi. This is just for the panel. Uh, I'm actually coming from an organization. We are an India literacy project. We fund pro literacy projects in India. I guess my question to you is a little different because this is so packed. I mean, this is new to me. Uh, what I see is we are doing the traditional model, right? Philanthropic model where we are, you know, going and working in the villages, uh, you know, obviously leveraging the government to, you know, raise literacy levels. What I would like to ask you is just a comment or, or you know, just throw some light on. Uh, do you see uh, any impact investing that can happen in education, especially in the rural area, uh, kind of leveraging what the government infrastructure is? The only, I guess, the, the only uh, uh, area I see in from our work is uh, maybe learning materials that we give to schools is one area that can improve the quality of education because enrollment, you know, obviously is very high. But beyond that, just in terms of you know, efficiency of the schools running, you know, just learning levels. Uh, I'm just curious to see, have you seen anything so far that can improve that levels? I'm talking about, you know, rural areas, number one. And then, uh, yeah, I just think, or if you don't see anything today, do you see anything that's possible in the near future? Um, wonderful panel, in fact. Uh, so I'm one of the entrepreneurs from India. Uh, I run a company called Alten. So for the first time I'm in US, uh, I have uh, been a scholarship recipient as well. Uh, I've been able to meet some amazing entrepreneurs uh, as part of SOCAP uh, from different countries. What I've realized is that uh, uh, back in India, what we are made to do uh, is, or what is the, the, the circumstances are that we have to run an entity in a sustainable model uh, so that we need to do a business first and then impact is a byproduct of what we are doing. And at the end of the day, we say that we are a social entrepreneur. But uh, over here, when I've met a lot of other people, uh, which are from Holland or from other countries or Africa as well, I've realized that uh, they have a lot of support from government in terms of uh, uh, that first grant or a philanthropic fund or just to prove that they're MVP first. And uh, then the business comes as a byproduct, but the major focus as uh, Audrey and as Kanthadi sir actually uh, mentioned is that on the impact first. Um, and that's where uh, we also would want to understand that uh, um, why, uh, why would not we have in India uh, uh, have a lot of support from the government or from other, other countries? Because at the end of the day, what we need to do is incorporate an entity parallel in U.S. to leverage the other grants or the other uh, uh, schemes which are there in U.S. Yeah, so that's what. So I've been grappling with this rise of the rest question about India that you mentioned, and I think it's, I think it's pretty interesting, and I want to hear what the panel thinks about this. Our experience in Omnivore is that um, the rise of the rest, when I say, when we say rise of the rest, what I mean specifically is talent in India migrates to the top six cities, and launching businesses outside of those six places is really freaking hard. And if we look at our portfolio of 12 companies, our two worst performing companies are the ones that have really struggled to recruit talent because they're in third and fourth tier cities. And so one of the things that we've said about our second fund is that we're really going to concentrate at least headquartering 
businesses in Mumbai, Pune, the NCR, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai. And, you, and we'd better have a damn good case if we're gonna go outside of those places. You can put your factories right in other places. You can, you can have field force all over the country, but headquarters, if you need good finance HR, right, and, and, and coders, you're, you're pretty screwed outside of those cities. That's our hypothesis. I, I'm wondering if you've had different experiences or how you think about this, because we don't want the world to be like this, but you know, with, with one business in Guwahati, right, another business in Rajkot, they've really struggled. Hi, um, my name is Tara. I'm the co-founder of a hybrid organization called Strength India, and I understand that problem you're talking about because I've been based in Varanasi for almost the past four years, uh, developing after-school programs for girls from violent backgrounds, and we've been launching a menstrual hygiene initiative recently. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested to hear more about that because I, my immediate instinct would be that it takes people on the ground to really change the issues, but I also run into issues with um, talent sourcing, which is incredibly difficult. I also have a more technical question that has to do with um, a Section 8 company and what you as investors feel is the flexibility of the Section 8 company model since it's a not-for-profit company, but it also issues equity shares which is a different instrument than I'm used to, being from the US, um, and especially as our team sort of straddles the line between philanthropy and social enterprise, um, what would be the ways that you as, as impact investors would recommend using that company tool um, within or outside of a pure for-profit model? Okay, thank you. There was one question about sort of examples of education model investment in India, and I think there are several that we could, we could, we could talk about, but we could also talk, talk about that offline if that's okay. There was a question around government support and how it seems like in the United States the government is much more supportive and in India it's not. And I think I certainly have some thoughts on that. I think maybe Vikram can, 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 can speak on that. Uh, and then there's rise of the rest. I mean, I think Ross has written a book on this topic. So maybe it's an interesting question. Uh, uh, and then this, this question that you just raised. So uh, I'll actually, maybe Audrey, if you wanted to jump in. I just want to say one word about the first question about last uh, r rural areas and Education. last mile businesses. And um, the, the, because we deploy very small amounts of money, relatively speaking, so it's somewhere between 30 and 60 lakh in the first round, we tend to be better positioned as an investor in service companies as opposed to, you know, heavy, big ticket product innovation companies. and. I'll just make a structural observation. Um, there, there are some, there are a couple of companies um, that we've seen, well, in our portfolio and that we've seen in, in peer portfolios that are uh, providing last mile service, looking at the end user finance piece, looking at the after sales service piece, looking at all those difficult things. What's astounding to me is that so many of us as an investor, as part of an investor community, are investing in trying to crack the same problem and when a company does, there's still, I haven't seen very many case studies where we see other companies being able to collaborate or leverage the success when it does happen. So uh, it's, it's unusual and it's just a, more of a structural observation about the nature of the interactions with, between ent entrepreneurs, which maybe Victoria could comment on. Um, maybe I'll, I'll make a quick comment on, on Mark's question, which is, um, just in my observation, uh, unfortunately it's true, and this is actually looking at other countries. So in the Philippines, for example, it's very difficult to invest in uh, companies that are located with headquarters outside of Manila in terms of uh, aggregating management talent. And I think it's a problem that we need to all work on collectively because, you know, India is not made up of six cities, but the reality is that um, that's where talent goes and it takes an entire ecosystem. So it's not just an India problem. You look at a number of African countries, you look at a no number of other Southeast Asian countries, and even though the markets are um, maybe uh, far flung or it's, a, it's even a nationwide um, initiative, talent still lives in a certain place and if you're going to get to execution at scale you can't compromise on talent and it's just it's our living reality and it's it's frustrating on on rural models i think you know 
there, there, there are some interesting models in healthcare, in education, in um, what I'll call media and information technology, where again, it's, it's this characteristic that you have these teams that are headquartered, let's say in Delhi, but you know, the, 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 the market that they're reaching is you know, all the way across you know, through Bihar and you know, some of the more difficult regions. And I don't think that, um, that, that rural markets need to be left out. Um, I, I think there are lots of opportunities that we've seen across all categories. Again, generally the management teams tend to be located in the, in the six major cities. When you're dealing with the north, they're normally in Delhi. If you're dealing you know, with middle, it's Mumbai, Pune, if, you know, Bangalore for the south. But, 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 but they're there, and they're very, very compelling business models at scale um, that we've seen, you know, usually leveraging some kind of technology, or they could be an information connectivity and media play serving sort of dark markets, but there's some very clever entrepreneurs that we take a lot of confidence in. Um, just briefly on the education point, so we've worked uh, last year with the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation focused on entrepreneurs that were sort of bridging the education to employment, so skills training and work for workforce development and have some models we could talk about there. Um, and then currently with Omidyar Network, that's a more K-12 focused batch of entrepreneurs um, and thinking about how to leverage technology and teacher training and tutoring centers and um, skills-based acquisition uh, that we're seeing be applicable broadly for last mile purposes. To Mark's question, I, I agree that it is hard and I, you know, we've invested in a dozen businesses in India and all of them have been in those same cities. So you know, we're not walking the talk yet about Rise of the Rest in India. But I would just offer that I think this, people would have made the same comment about the US pick a number of years, you know, however many years ago, two, five, 10 years ago. And even Peter Thiel, I think last year said when speaking in Chicago, like anybody who knows anything only goes to New York or San Francisco, which is horribly offensive to all of the people who live in anywhere besides those two cities. So I would just, I would just hesitate to say, yes, the work is super hard, which Maya just said, but there's got to be talent there, and there's got to be a way that an ecosystem with the right amount of investment can, can make either importing the talent or keeping the talent there viable, because I think otherwise the risk is you see what we are seeing some of happen now in the US. Thoughts on the government question and the role I of government? Think, uh, so one is just on the Section 8 thing. I think um, what I've seen, in, you know, I'm on a board of a few companies, and particularly in the microfinance area, some of them have been started in a way that the original shareholders and promoters did it in a Section 8 company, and there are others that did not. And I think what that does do at least is send a strong message of mission drift or avoidance thereof, because you cannot take the profits out, you gotta just plow, plow them back into the business. So I think the benefit of as long as that's your intent, uh, is, is that, is that it kind of keeps you true to the mission and keeps you away from a mission drift. So from that perspective, I think that's a positive. Um, you know, on, in terms of the government, it's a, it's a tricky one. I mean, ultimately, you know, in, I don't know what's gonna happen with the government's stature in the US, but that's a separate issue and what they're doing on impact investing. But, um, um, but it, you know, ultimately the governments are the biggest impact investors, however you put it. And so the question really is, how can you uh, really work with the government to influence policy so that whatever money they're spending on their budget can support activities such as yours? So at Asha, in fact, the, the model that we have is we make investments in, you know, in low-income housing and some financial inclusion focused on small businesses and a couple of other areas. But a key part of the trust that we set up is actually to focus on government advocacy in those areas. So by making those investments and by working with the entrepreneurs, we learn a lot of what's going on, what's working on the ground, and then work with the government in terms of saying, look, these are the policies that are working, let's expand them, these are really not working. It's, a, it's amazing that the amount of money which government actually allocates to things never reaches the people, and this is not because of corruption or anything. First of all, people don't know what's due to them, and then otherwise there's, there's just a complete disconnect. So I think it's things like that. I, there is a push upon in terms of, you know, start up India and let's do this and let's do that. So I think there's talk about it, but I think implementing those strategies would be key. And the more you can go and talk to the right people within governments with having real experience on the ground, I think the more credibility you have. We've also, you know, talking about the CSR law and how can the CSR issue be plugged in more to, to impact investment, et cetera, which again, you know, unfortunately in India, basically everything is designed to kind of 
deal with the lowest common denominator, which is, you know, as opposed to, okay, if 20% of the people are going to misuse the system, that's okay for 80% of the people who are not. But that's, <laughs> our experience has suggested that's not what happens. Lund, anything to add? No, I think there's massive government support, and it yeah. just goes through the vehicle of incubators and academic institutions. The budget for those incubators went up sixfold this last year. The government created a 2,000 crore fund of funds that's been giving money to funds like the Omnivore Fund, the Mentera Fund, yeah. and in turn, these funds are investing these monies. The government's not visible. There's no government scheme you can apply for, but there are all these organizations that are receiving government support to support entrepreneurs like you. It's just a question of getting into one of those programs and then getting that support. We've seen fantastic increase in government funding and support for entrepreneurship. Medical devices, Virac gives money on just a napkin. It's a 15 minute presentation and you get 50 lakhs to do an early stage product development. So there's tremendous amount of support in specific sectors through the incubators, through the fund of funds. It's just a question of getting to the right organizations that are tasked with deploying that. And keep in mind, you know, that the work of the government is pretty much the same as the work of impact investors and the, align the alignment between their priorities are huge. Just look at the, even the names of the different schemes. You know, you have Swachh Bharat, which matches to sanitation. You've got Jan Dhan Yojana, which matches to financial inclusion. Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, housing for all, energy access for all. These are literally the five or six sectors in which impact investors operate. Yeah. And what we have seen in the last uh, couple of years uh, uh, is an increasing openness towards, you know, towards impact investment in the government. And, and I think uh, that, should, that should hopefully continue. So I think we've just uh, literally ran out of time. So uh, before closing, I would just request each of you maybe to just give one or two statements, uh, just maybe summarizing, if we could, kind of the key takeaway, or if there's one single most important lesson that you think either India or the US has, you know, and what would, what would that be? Uh, something for the entrepreneurs to, uh, you know, to take home. We can go maybe from okay. <laughs> um, Well, Audrey made an interesting point that we didn't uh, have time to speak about here, but I think figuring out what models, given our global lens, doing more work on our portfolio to see what's working in different regions, either from the US that we can bring to India or from India that we can bring to the US or other emerging markets, um, is a place that I still see a lot of opportunity. Um, and there are some groups uh, that have started doing this, a group called Canovo that's doing it in Mexico and has imported some models that they think can be franchisable. Um, but I think that's, that's where all of these, you know, the conferences and convenings and the risk tolerant capital that's put, been put out um, will really come to fruition if we can take some of these lessons and not keep making the same mistakes in different markets um, or having a bunch of entrepreneurs do really hard work when we know little nuggets of things that can unlock potential um, in the places that we work. I think just from an investor perspective, I think the, um, uh, you know, the, the issue of, well, I think this happens in the US and in India is that as soon as you talk about impact investing, it immediately triggers the thing of concessionary capital. And so in my, in my view, if there's a way to kind of, there's a huge role for concessionary capital, there's a huge role for government as, as Gant rightly pointed out. Uh, but if, if we are gonna view this as, as in India, or even here, that it's a business, whether it's technology or the customer base, as to how can we in both markets really get away from this notion that, you know, capital generating a market-based return can also have huge impact. I would just add from having um, just been focused on the Indian market since 2006 and now with a two dozen or so companies in our portfolio, uh, it's been incredibly impressive how much creativity and passion and social innovation we have seen in, in the market. I just would say for those who are keen to enter or dip a toe in or to participate, the, they're really, the ecosystem is penetrable and it requires showing up. Uh, um, there are relationships in place and, um, and I think they're relatively easily leveraged. So people are willing to connect you to others and, 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 and work together. So I think that's a really positive side of the, the, the experience. I would also just add one point which is interesting about this the government uh, angle that was brought up earlier. This is the first SOCAP that we have very high level, now think what you will of the United Nations, but it's the first time that there's very high level UN people showing up for this conversation. 
it's interesting in terms of the implications that this has for their influence on how their member governments are behaving when it comes to allocations of, of capital and public finance. So I would just say, you know, I think that's something we all have to watch and ask lots of questions about. And just a brief point on that, actually, you know, the UN SDGs are potentially a great way of creating alignment. We're talking yeah. about all different countries having their own views on things, but the SDGs are universal. Rallying cry. Yeah. So um, I think there's a fairly steep pyramid. There's high quality at the top, but there's so much money chasing those deals. I think the opportunity lies at one level below, where there are some weaknesses, and if you are willing to work hard to help the entrepreneur address those weaknesses, there's an opportunity to create real businesses, there's an opportunity to create real impact, opportunity to create real returns. So be prepared to do that, and there is opportunity. I think may maybe one comment I'll ma make that we didn't uh, talk about very distinctly. I I've always seen uh, India in the scope of the global work that we do, and especially with respect to other um, emerging market economies as the great sort of hotbed of innovation and, and entrepreneurial energy. And the innovations, you know, the, 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 the creativity that comes out of the Indian um, uh, impact ecosystem, the social et uh, enterprise ecosystem is phenomenal. And because you have char characteristics of a very large market, you know, density in a lot of places, um, there's so much exciting stuff that goes on that, again, a lot of the rest of the frontier world can learn from. Circumstances may be di more difficult in this frontier world, but India, for me, has always had the um, ability to lead the way, and I think that'll continue to be true in the future with a lot of innovation for um, producing you know, social and environmental and economic good. So I would just say, you know, remain inspired because because it's it's just it's such a phenomenal opportunity to do some really 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 cool stuff in the world and and um, it's very exciting to do work and 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 see folks in India and it's just it's an inspiration to all of us you know sitting up here on this side of the the, the table. Great. Well, thank you all very much and thank you all for coming. I think those are excellent words to end by.